So Subtext is one of my favorite apps to support our readers because it does the two things that I said support comprehension of text and meaning making with text. Text-based analysis and text-based talk. And it was recently bought by Renaissance Learning. So you folks are going to get access to it through AR. It's not ready yet, but it is coming. Now when you go to, anybody here with their personal iPad right now? If you, okay, well she could download, if, you wanted, if you're on your personal iPad, you can download subtext now and follow along. When you get to subtext, you have to log in with Google or Gmail or log in with Edmodo. And the reason I love this is because I hear it from principals all the time. Dr. McVeary, Greg, or, you know, they'll find me on Twitter and say, I need a closed reading rubric. Closed reading isn't an outcome. We have to stop thinking that way. It is a technique that we use to do the things that are in the anchor standards, like identify key ideas and details, analyze author's craft. When you look at the literacy, literature standards, they're broken up into those four elements. You use close, those are your outcomes. Closed reading is how you get there. And subtext is probably one of the most powerful apps. Yes, sir? Closed reading, is this something that's come back? Because I recall that years ago. Yes. This is not a new It's not, well, you figure the, the new, the school, um, the, yeah, I might, you're going to, you're calling me, catching me off guard. Um, from the, the, the new criticism schools um, back in the, in the 50s, it is. Um, it's a, it, I, I believe it to be an epistemological view, a world of how we, a view of how we learn no, knowledge that is um, deeply in, t intertwined with the common core and with our corporate testing environment that content is key and that individual introspection in the individual matters less, the content matters more. Um, I find that pervasive in the thinking that shaped the common core. I find it pervasive in our testing environment and in the types of testing that's being involved. But it is, you know, Connecticut tried to get for the race of the trough money, um, so we immediately, after spending years redoing our language art standards, dropped them immediately and just added a link to the Common Core and didn't get the money. So we, got all, we did all of the reforms with none of the federal support, um, and it's what we have. But I do support the idea of text-based analysis and text-based talk. There's nothing wrong with that. And I really love the anchor standards in the Common Core um, because they do provide us a direction. I'm not as huge as a fan on the grade level expectations, and I hope it's a living document and those grade level expectations shift a little bit. But when I read the, the anchor standards and I look at the, the, them for, um, especially in the literature section or in the writing section, I believe in that's good teaching, so I'm okay with that. But yeah, you are absolutely right. It is a theoretical viewpoint that has become more dominant in recent years, um, and reader response theory is starting to, you know, wane a little bit. So when you log, change slide. So once you log in, once you log into. Um, Subtext, you'll see a few things here. This teacher's guide, right here, it's more powerful than everything I'm going to teach you. It will be a huge tool when you guys eventually get it. You can make classroom groups here, and I'll teach you more about that in a second. Or you can tap to add books and articles here. So when you tap add a new book or article, you have a couple choices. You can use their book collections. Browse your public library if they have EPUBs, or find free web articles. Subtext uses EPUBs. It says .epup. Um, that does not. That means it can't work with iBooks or Kindle apps because those aren't EPUB formats. However, do I have any 11th grade teachers in here? Any 12th grade teachers? You guys reading Shakespeare? Yeah, I mean, it's, in the, it's required by the Common Core that you read it in 11th and 12th grade. Um, so... I thought it was just suggested. Not when you... There's a difference. The only texts that are required, okay. if you look at the anchor standards, mm -hmm. it actually mentions specifically Shakespeare. The only texts required by the Common Core are a few founding documents, which include the Declaration of Independence, 
the Gettysburg Address, and then Shakespeare. Um, it's, it's, so you can kind of, there, we can talk later about the dead white guy bias in the Common Core, um, and if that exists. But Shakespeare, in, it's actually listed in the Anchor Standards. Not, it's not part of the suggested texts that are in Appendix B. Um, Appendix B is a readability level of a suggested text, not a required purchasing. Um, but no, Shakespeare is required in the Common Core. Um, we'll pull up the standards later and I can show you. But once, because this is part of um, AR and Renaissance Learning bought it, you will eventually get access to all of their book collections in subtext. However, until then, you can use web articles and free books. Shakespeare is in the public domain. Crucible might be. I don't know the, I don't know the publication date of Crucible, if it's in the public domain yet. Um, but it's not in the public domain? Oh, okay. It's not, there's a website out there that has a text, but it's, well, I don't think it's supposed to be. Yeah, then I wouldn't encourage you to yeah. do that, especially when I'm still recording. When I hit pause, I might say something different. Um, but you could take Shakespeare or, or Twain or anything that you're reading that's in the public domain. There's a website called Project Gutenberg. And you can download all those EPUBs and import them right here into subtext. But for now, we can just, I'm going to talk about the free web articles and information. So when you click on add a free article, this is what I love. The articles are organized by reading level. Now, the text complexity triangle involves three things, quantitative, qualitative, and reader. However, it's really, you know, the easiest thing to get at is the quantitative level, the readability level. They use the, they use the ATOS readability formula, which they talk about here. So that's um, what subtext uses. And then they organize all of their um, articles by grade level, by reading level, which is a powerful tool for you. So I select, you know, um, from 9, 7 to 11th grade, Reading, reading ability. And I could also, or I could do a couple things. I could go directly to a website if it's an article I want. I could search Google on a topic and find that article. If you're working on a computer, you can add this button. It's called a bookmarklet right to your web browser. And whenever you find something interesting that you wanted to read, you can hit the button. So maybe... You were on, you're on Twitter and you went to Ing Chat last night, which is every Monday at 7 o'clock. It's when all the English teachers around the country like, talk about a topic. Um, and you saw a great article. You could just hit that button and save it into subtext into your library for your students to use. Working on a group project with a disciplinary teacher or a trade teacher. Um, and there's some argument about, you know, um, fuel injectors, and you're working with them on work with kids reading that. This is a great way to find specific articles to a discipline. Um, in, is it ninth, tenth grade that you guys read Mice and Men? Ninth. ninth grade. So ninth grade, you're reading Mice and Men. We're talking about increasing the amount of literary nonfiction in the English classroom. I love connecting literary nonfiction two ways. Through the different themes that we're teaching. So, um, and this is an idea I stole from Alicia. Um, but the idea that, you know, one of the very most common themes is the American dream in Mice and Men. There's a way you can take that theme and connect it to nonfiction by having kids look for that theme. Is the American dream still possible? So now you have ways to find information text to support. It's not really technically what the Common Core calls literary nonfiction because it hasn't, you know, it's not but you just non-fiction informational text connected to your literature. So in the English classroom, that's how I connect, increase my amount of non-fiction reading. I don't just willy-nilly throw it out there. I connect it to the books that I'm reading. Maybe through character analysis. You know, you have certain, you, you do a character analysis of a, of a fictional character and then have students find somebody that is like that and not like that in real life and do, you know, some biographical details. So therefore, I still let the discipline of English language arts drive my instruction. Because I, that is one of the things I don't stand when they say, oh, well, we learn things that you know, don't matter, like denouement, or like, no. English is a specific discipline that has very specific disciplinary ways of reading and writing. 
And too often it is thrown on you that it's your job to teach everybody to read and write. That's not your job. Your job is to focus in on the specific disciplinary ways of making meaning. And how do we talk like literary critics? How do we talk like authors? How do we talk like readers? Not your job is to teach them how to read and write. That's everyone's job. And they have to do that within a very specific disciplinary lens. So, I, sorry I'm off on a little tangent here, but it's, you know, it's something near and dear to my heart as an English teacher. Um, that you have a very specific skill set that you want students to learn. And that your discipline matters as much as every other discipline. And those disciplines matter as much as yours. So you can find disciplinary specific articles to read in subtext. So for example, this was in that grade level band that I um, selected. This was the article of the week from CNN. And all I do is I click up here on Save to Subtext. And now you'll see it here. Oops. You'll see it here in my library. As you add things to your library, it will just build and build and build, and it will stay in your library. Because we, we couldn't find the rope. How to what? How to get from here to where you are. Oh, you can't. <laughs> Even on this, I can't get somewhere like that? No, this is, this is my, a presentation I built on my iPad. Okay. All right. You can, I mean, there's extra iPads here, but um, I did, the woman was here from Renaissance Learning, your representative, and she did say that they are creating a application that will work on computers. So for those schools that do not have iPads, which is most, or do not have the iPod touch carts, um, it will work on computers eventually soon. Uh, but yeah, this is just a, a slideshow that I made. Okay, I was just trying to get into it. Now, you pull up the text. Here's, this is what I love. Here's the article that we selected in my library. I opened it up. You can then highlight, uh, you can then highlight the text and you get a couple options. Notice here, here's the title up here. Opinion on NSA spying White House ignorance. But you get a couple options in the program right here. Highlight, discuss, Google, copy. And this is where purposeful, I call text annotation purposeful coding. Because when we annotate a text for meaning, we need to read with a purpose. It's always about reading with a purpose in mind. And when I click on highlight, I get a couple options. I can tag my colors. Now, how do most of our students annotate text? Well, most of them don't do it all. Or if they do, it might look like this, and they highlight the entire thing. You know, coloring is not high, highlighting can often lead to coloring. I delineate highlighting from annotating based on purpose. When you're coding text for a purpose, you're annotating for meaning. And that is how we use closed reading to reach the outcomes of the common core when we look at the anchor standards through purposeful coding. I find it easy to assess that way because I could, do, I could give my students an activity in September where I ask them to purposefully code a text and I could teach it for a long time and then come back in December and then I can count. How many, how many main ideas did they identify? How much support? Or did they circle transition words? Did they number the number of arguments? Did they find counterclaims? So that's the way you really look at it. That's what I call coding for purpose. Now with these tags here, I could do that. I could say, for example, this one here will be my um, main arguments. This one, or my position statement. This one here will be my main arguments. Here I'll have evidence. This one I will use for counterclaims. This one I will use for transition words. And this program will generate the reports and let you know how many students, what sections did they, did they identify. And what a great formative assessment. Maybe you give your kids an argument of essay to read and seven of them identified the same main argument, but 14 didn't. You know that you need to adjust your instruction and maybe provide a mini lesson on the idea of main arguments and identifying main arguments. 
Because to me, that's what formative assessment is. is it gives me on-the-spot data to transform my teaching in order to reach my learners. When I see companies selling formative assessments, like formative assessment doesn't come in a box. When I, when I, when I hear that it does, it makes me throw up in my mouth a little bit um, because it's just not what it's for. It's not, it's not a product. It's a process to improve my teaching that leads to improving student learning. Yes? When you say it'll run reports on how the students did, you have to go in and set it up like you would. You'll make, and I'll show you that in a second. Yeah. Um, I don't have a premium account, so I can't show you the reports. Um, but as they integrate um, Accelerated Reader into sub, or really integrate subtext into your Accelerated Reader program, um, you'll have access to this stuff, more so than me. I'm gonna, she's going to give me a premium account so I can get um, a, 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 the reports. Right now it would be twenty nine ninety five a year, and I might just buy it. It's one of those things that I just might spend my own money on um, because it's just it's so powerful. So I use text. So for example, on this one, I was, I was focusing, on, focusing on informational text. Um, even though this is an opinion piece, it was just, you know, this is the demonstration. So maybe I select the yellow tag as the main idea. And down here below, oops, I would have my students write more than main idea. They might have to synthesize that information, put it, change it, and make it their own. So, you know, write me a gist statement of, of that section that you highlighted. Put it in your own words, in other, other words. And now, if you look here, you would see where the student left a note. And you'd see the color of that note. And it's color-coded based on your code book based on how you told them to purposefully code a text. You have other options here. You can click the Discuss button. Discussion. Here you have a couple options. You can make it private so that only you and the student can see it. You can reply because it's a threaded discussion. Do all group members get to see the reply? You can add more groups to make it visible. This is my favorite feature, the spoiler feature. Um, I finally just read Ender's Game. I was never really into science fiction growing up, but like I just started after um, reading some, you know, more fantasy and sci-fi and seeing the movie that came out, I really wanted to read the book because I heard there's a major plot twist at the end, and there is. But what if my students are discussing that plot twist, but other kids haven't finished reading the book? You don't want it to be ruined by the discussion. So they can mark it as a spoiler. So they know, and it will say, it won't give you them any information, it will just say spoiler alert on the discussion. That's an awesome feature. Also, you can set it to where kids can't see any other discussion until they post their own responses. And that's a nice feature because then you know that their writing is their own. At some time, you might want to set that feature on so they can't see any responses until they post a response so that their, I, their thinking wasn't influenced by others. I personally have no problem with my, thinking about literature being influenced by the way that other people think about literature because that's what it means to be in a community of readers and writers. Um, but that feature is available to you if you want to protect the data for assessment. Now, up here you have other options, which is this is a great feature. You can do the comments as a discussion. You can do multiple choice questions, true, false, or make polls. Um, so, um, so a spoiler alert here, uh, now that the second, now that Catching Fire is coming out, you can maybe make a poll um, about, you know, certain plot elements that come up. Did you think that X should happen? Yes or no? Explain your answer. You could put it so it's at the end of the chapter of the book before you send it to the kids. You can build your quizzes right into the text. And they can go back and use the book as they're completing the questions. I've never really understood the concept of making a test for a novel. I haven't. Because when I go and ask people how they read novels, none of them ever sit down and, and, and fill out a matching, you know, an essay question, sure, that's literary analysis. But the literary analysis that they'll have to do in college, they can return to the text. So when I give, like, I've never understood the decoupling of the text 
from the assessment in, in English and language arts. So you, might, you might disagree, and that's okay. I'm just sharing my personal philosophy. So that's why I like this idea of building it right into the text, because then you're, you're not decoupling the two. Um, again, you can decide who sees it, who sees the reply. Now, you also have the option, this is what I love, of creating groups and joining groups. So this is, you could make a group for your classroom. You could make a group for your um, book, or you could do literature discussion groups in your classrooms. I mean, I, those who are familiar with liter literature circles are kind of getting away from the idea that I'm the synthesizer, I'm the um, questioner, I'm the visualizer, you know? That ends up with just five kids doing five separate tasks and everyone fighting over to be the visualizer because they just want to draw a picture and be done with it. Um, it's bad literature discussions. We want to support and model the idea of talking about literature. So you could do small group discussions within a book. Maybe you, in your AR literacy labs, you know, you have five different books going on at once. Make one group for each book. But my favorite idea, because your district has supported a common read for so long, in ninth grade, you could make just an entire school-wide Mice and Men group. In 11th grade, you could make an entire school-wide Crucible group. And they could discuss that all at once, school-wide. And have you know, smaller groups for smaller discussions but that's very powerful. And that's, I think we were talking about why blended learning. Because that's not, you're, it's not possible to do those school-wide discussions without blended learning. There's no way that period A could be talking to period, I don't even know how you guys arrange your periods, but period D, um, third trimester, because you guys have those shifting cycles. So you could have kids talking about literature cross cycles. So that's where I think the blended learning um, really comes in. You can name your group. So here's my little CT tech group. Um, and then they send you here, they'll send you a code. And you have to give that code to your students. So they're not, groups aren't public. So they email you a code, and then you give that code to your students. So when they click join a group, it will say enter the code. And they have to enter in that code to join. And so thanks, congrats, you've started your group. So that's subtext in a nutshell. Um, you don't have any iPads yet. It will be there, and it will also be on your computer, and Renaissance Learning is going to fully support it. But it is the best way to, I think, in my opinion, use mobile learning technology to support text-based discussion through text and text-based analysis. The best part for me is that it does the two in conjunction, that they're discussing text while they're analyzing text.